Uh, so hello everybody. Let's recall what utilitarianism is. Remember that utilitarianism is a, uh, a theory of right action. And what that basically is is just a general explanation of what makes actions morally right or what makes them morally wrong. So utilitarianism gives what at least appears on its face to be a relatively straightforward answer. Um, the morally correct action is the one that produces the greatest happiness for the greatest number of individuals. There are a few um, important aspects to this theory. So first, insofar as Mill is a utilitarian, he's also a consequentialist. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, if you're a consequentialist, you say, well, there are a lot of different aspects to actions, right? When we act, we have a certain intention. Um, there's also a certain outcome of the action. And so you might ask, well, what is it that matters from a moral point of view when we're evaluating whether an action is good or bad? And if you're a consequentialist, you say, well, the only thing that matters is the consequences of that action. So for instance, let's say you're thinking about, okay, is it morally right, right or wrong to lie in a given instance? A consequentialist would say, it doesn't matter what the intent or the motive is behind that lie. All that matters is, does lying bring about good consequences or does it bring about bad consequences for all that are involved or affected by the action? Right? So that's what a consequentialist holds. So Mill's a consequentialist. And if you're a consequentialist, then the next question you should ask is, well, okay, how do we know whether some consequence is good or bad? And that brings us to the second aspect of Mill's utilitarianism. He's also a hedonist. And so what does this mean? Well, let's actually look at what Mill himself says about hedonism. He says, the utilitarian doctrine is that happiness is desirable and the only thing desirable as an end, all other things being only desirable as means to that end. Okay, so what does that mean? Essentially this, if you're a hedonist, you think there's only one thing that has what philosophers call intrinsic value, or there's only one intrinsic good. And what that means is there's only one thing that's valued for itself, and that's pleasure. There are many other things that are valuable, uh, tables and chairs and cars and going to college and um, learning new things and experiencing beautiful works of art. All those things are valuable, but they're all instrumental goods. The reason they're valuable is because they produce pleasure. The only thing that's actually valuable in itself is pleasure. Um, and for that reason, to live a good human life, you need to pack as much pleasure into your life as possible, right? So that's the hedonist view. So from a moral standpoint now, if we combine consequentialism and we combine hedonism, then we can see that from a moral point of view, what we should be trying to do is say, okay, what are the actions I can take that will produce as much pleasure as possible in the world? Um, and also reduce pain as much as possible. Because remember, Mill defines happiness as the presence of pleasure and the absence of pain. In this lesson, I'm really gonna focus on hedonism. And as I said, uh, we're gonna look at one objection to hedonism, because the first thing you might think to yourself when you realize Mill is a hedonist, is you might say, well, wait a minute. This seems like a very shallow way to look at human life. Um, are hu aren't human beings more than just pleasure-seeking pleasure uh, beings? Hasn't Socrates told us we should really put pleasure aside and focus on more important things, improving the soul, uh, gaining knowledge, those sorts of questions? And so we might think that just hedonism presents a very degrading view of human nature. And in fact, this was an objection that Mill himself anticipated. Uh, so here's how we, he's describing essentially in this passage what individuals, what critics might think of his theory. So Mill says, now, such a theory of life excites in many minds in inveterate dislike, right? So many people who are thinking about my theory are very much going to dislike my theory. Well, why is that? To suppose that life has, as they express it, no higher end than pleasure, no better and nobler object of desire and pursuit, they, de they designate as utterly mean and groveling as a doctrine worthy only of swine. So this is the, the key phrase I want to focus on here. Critics of hedonism will say that, well, the doctrine of happiness and human flourishing you've given us isn't a doctrine of human flourishing at all. What you've told us about is how to live a good life for an animal, for, for swine, for a pig rolling around in the pigsty. How could this possibly be the correct human conception of happiness? 
Um, and so philosophers today, and what we'll refer to this as, they call this the swine objection. Um, and so one contemporary philosopher, Fred Feldman, he uses the following thought experiment to explain this objection. So this is, it's a little bit of an, a strange example, but, uh, you know, it's not mine. So you can take that up with Fred Feldman, I suppose. So here's what, what Feldman says. Uh, we'll call this case Porky. So it, he says, imagine a person, we can call him Porky, who spends all his time in the pigsty engaging in the most obscene sexual activities imaginable. Let's imagine that Porky happily carries on like this for many years. Imagine also that Porky has no human friends, no other sources of pleasure, no interesting knowledge. Um, when we're thinking about the case of Porky, you're not thinking about a pig. You're thinking about an adult human being who's spending all his time rolling around in the pigsty, hanging out with the pigs. No other human friends, um, no pursuit of knowledge, no pursuit of beauty, no pursuit of moral goodness, rolling around the pigsty doing what pigs do. Right? Um, and so. The reason that Feldman brings this up is because it sort of encapsulates the swine objection, right? The idea is, how can a man like this, just hanging on the pigsty, how could such a man be said to be living a good human life? And it seems on its face that this is a problem, because as we've described the story, this person's perfectly content. Uh, they engage in many activities they find pleasurable. Uh, they don't have any real discontent. So the question is, what can we say? Would we say that this person's living a flourishing human life? And we can put this objection in the form of an argument. So I'll call this the swine objection argument. So P1, if hedonism is true, then Porky's life is going well for him. Okay, so what's behind this? Well, if it just is the case that all that really matters is pleasure, and although Porky's lifestyle is somewhat odd to us, somewhat foreign, and somewhat disgusting. Uh, it just is the case that he's experiencing uh, a good deal of pleasure. And so if hedonism really is true, then we should look at Porky, it seems, and say, wow, he's got to figure it out. This is someone who knows how to live a good life. But P2, Porky's life isn't going well for him. Now, maybe this is controversial, and, and this is something I invite you to think more about, but to some people's intuitions anyway, they're going to look at Porky and say, well, this person might think they're living a good human life. They might think they have it all figured out, but in fact, we should feel sorry for them. This is someone we should pity. We should look at them and say, there's really a whole swath of human experience that you don't understand. There's a whole swath of human experience that is just not available to you that you're never going to know about, right? And we, so, I mean, you can imagine what Aristotle, what Socrates would say about Porky's life. If Socrates is correct that an unexamined life is not worth living for a human being, then certainly Porky's life of hanging out in the pigsty <laughs> and not pursuing any interesting knowledge would not qualify as an examined life. So the critics of the swine of uh, Mill's hedonism will say, well, Porky's life isn't going well for him. Therefore, we have to conclude that there's something wrong with hedonism. Hedonism just is not true. Let's consider this argument um, a little further. And, and these are, I have some questions here, and these are really the questions that you ought to think about. Um, specifically regarding P2. And ask yourself, what do you think, right, when you think about Porky? Is, again, is this person, a person who has everything figured out? Um, does the fact that he doesn't seem to be uncontent with his life, is that enough to say that his life is going well? So do you feel pity or jealousy toward him? Is he someone that you pity and say, wow, there's really a lot more to life that you don't understand, um, that you could be experiencing? Or are you jealous? You say, I have all these responsibilities. Um, you know, I have to go to school. I have to get a job. Um, pursuing interesting knowledge, understanding beautiful works of art. These things are hard. And as we'll talk about a little later, they can produce a lot of dissatisfaction. Um, but Porky doesn't have to worry about any of that. So maybe he does have it figured out. Right, so one way to attack one way to, to attack this argument would be to deny P two. Say Porky's life is going great, and in fact, therefore hedonism is true. It gives us exactly the answer we would expect. Now, interestingly enough, that was not the route that Mill himself took. So Mill, he accepts P two. He says P two is true. Mill says Porky is not. Well, he, he didn't, of course. <laughs> 
uh, wasn't talking about the example of Porky, but what Mill would say is Porky's life is not going well for him. What he denied was P1. He said there's nothing about hedonism that forces us to think that Porky's life is actually going well. So let's see what how Mill actually responds. When thus attacked, the Epicureans, and just to put it bluntly, this is a school of philosophy that was also hedonist. So when thus attacked, the hedonists have always answered that it is not they but their accusers who represent human nature in a, in a degrading light. Since the accusation supposes human beings to be capable of no pleasures except those of which swine are capable. The comparison of the Epicurean life to that of beasts is felt as degrading, precisely because a beast's pleasures do not satisfy a human being's conception of happiness. So, for Mill, when people criticize him and say, well, your hedonism is degrading, there's more to human life than pleasure. He says, no, it's the critics that are degrading human life. What they don't realize is that they seem to be working with this notion that the only sorts of things that one can mean by pleasure are eating, drinking, sleeping, having sex, you know, the immediate pleasures that are also available to non-human animals. But he says, no, that's not correct. Of course, we also share those pleasures. Um, and perhaps a good life needs some share of those pleasures. Mill explicitly says that. But it is not the case that those are the only pleasures that human beings can enjoy. And it's because those are not the only pleasures a human being can enjoy, that's the reason why, at the end of the day, Porky's life isn't going well for him. Okay, so how do we explain this? Well, Mill famously draws this distinction between higher and lower pleasures. He says there's no known Epicurean, or just, just read Epicurean as hedonist, there's no known Epicurean theory of life which does not assign to the pleasures of the intellect, of the feelings and imagination, and of the moral sentiments a much higher value as pleasures than to those of mere sensation. Okay, so we have this basic split here in this, in this passage. There's two types of pleasure. There's the higher pleasures, and there are the lower pleasures. So let's start with the lower pleasures. Um, these are the ones of mere sensation, the ones I just mentioned, eating, drinking, sleeping, having sex, right? Things that are, um, they don't make use of our intellectual faculties. They don't make use of our higher capacity for thinking, um, even our higher capacity for feeling. They don't take advantage of our um, ability to love and hope and dream, right? Just mere sen uh, pleasures of sensation. If, and if you're familiar, if you were familiar with the word hedonism before, it's usually meant, it's usually used to refer to pleasures like this. So a hedonist just seeks immediate gratification. Um, they overindulge their appetites. So Mill agrees, of course, there are those sorts of pleasures. But his point is that there's this whole other set of pleasures, the higher pleasures, which he characterizes as pleasures of the intellect, feelings and imagination, and the moral sentiment. So let's let's sort of go through these one by one. Pleasures of the intellect. We have a certain pleasure that comes from figuring out something hard, learning a new skill, um, studying philosophy, uh, learning how to do a really difficult math problem and succeeding. There's a pleasure associated with all those things. Pleasures of feelings and the imagination. Right? So I mentioned some of these before. If you think about the pleasure you get from a loving relationship, um, that you have with a significant other or your family. Um, you know, that sort of relationship can be difficult. It can demand a lot of you. You have to sacrifice for the other person. You have to negotiate with them how to live together effectively, and none of that can be easy. But at the same time, there is undoubtedly a certain sort of pleasure that you get from that sort of relationship that you don't get just from, you know, talking with a mere acquaintance that, you know, requires no work or effort. And then this is one of the interesting ones to me. It mentions pleasures of the moral sentiments. There is a sense in which morality can feel like a burden. So, you know, there's a, you might say, okay, well, I have a job interview coming up. I know I could tell a little lie and I won't be found out. Maybe it'll increase my prospects of getting the job. Um, you know, you notice, oh, I, you know, I should maybe donate to charity. I should help others out. But, 
I'd really just rather keep the money for myself and, you know, maybe go on a nice vacation or go to the movies, right? So there's a sense in which morality itself can feel like a burden. But what Mill points out is that when you do the right thing and you have that recognition that you have, you know, helped to better humanity, that you've made a sacrifice for the common good, there's a certain sort of pleasure that comes along with that of understanding that you've acted in a moral way. And that's not something that's available to other species. So even if you want to say, you know, sometimes we use moral language to refer to other animals, like, you know, a dog is a great example. You might say, well, that's a really loyal dog. Okay. But it's not really the same thing. Like the dog isn't conscious of itself having the virtue of loyalty. Um, and it can't, for that reason, it can't enjoy um, its moral behavior. So this is a sort of pleasure that only human beings can really have. And again, it's a pleasure that comes from a process of struggle, of self-sacrifice. Um, and so these are the sorts of pleasures, the higher pleasures, which if you go back to Porky again, the sorts of things he would not be able to enjoy. And at the end of the day, that's why Mill is going to say, there's so much more to life that he isn't experiencing. There's so many more pleasures he could be enjoying, but is not. Um, and that's why his life is not going well for him. There's only one other point I want, I want to make here. So there's a couple ways you might think about the difference between um, higher and lower pleasures. So one way, so just compare the pleasures of the intellect to the pleasures of eating. One way you might say, well, why are these pleasures higher? What's better about them? Um, you might simply say that the pleasures of the intellect, they just give you a greater quantity of pleasure, right? So that moment when you figure out the really difficult math problem um, that you've been struggling to figure out for a long time, it just gives you a greater amount of pleasure than, um, than eating a really tasty cheeseburger or something. Okay, so that's true. And Mill does agree with that. He thinks that the higher pleasures, they do give a greater quantity of pleasure. But he says also, it's not just that it's a greater quantity, the quality of the pleasure itself is superior. So here's what he says. It is quite compatible with the principle of utility to recognize the fact that some kinds of pleasure are more desirable and more valuable than others. Notice, right, in italicized kinds. It would be absurd that while in estimating all other things, quality is considered as well as quantity, the estimation of pleasures should be supposed to depend on quantity alone. So what's he saying? Well, all the time we take into account not just how much of something we have, but what is the quality of the thing. So why should it be different with pleasure? He thinks it's not just that figuring out a really difficult math problem gives you more pleasure, because if that was the case, then you could just eat a lot of cheeseburgers to make up for it. Like, yeah, I'm not going to, you know, what's the point of working hard to solve the math problem? I'll just, you know, do a lot of really, I'll watch a lot of Netflix. I'll eat a lot of cheeseburgers. Um, I'll take a lot of naps, whatever. I'll just do a lot of those sort of low level pleasure things to equal the amount of pleasure I would have gotten from solving the math problem. And also solving the math problem involves pain and involves struggle. So at the end of the day, if it was just about quantity, then you'd say, well, the better path, obviously, is to pursue the lower pleasures, which is precisely what Mill is not advocating. So he's saying there's something different in the very quality of the pleasure itself. There's something about the pleasures of the intellect, the pleasures of the moral sentiments, the pleasures of feelings and imagination, that you cannot equal that sort of pleasure no matter how many of the pleasures of sensation you pursue. Um, and so it's important to recognize here that he's saying the higher pleasures are qualitatively superior to the lower pleasures. No amount of the lower pleasures can really equal the enjoyment you get from the higher pleasures. Okay, so we have this picture here of the higher and lower pleasures. And the next question you might ask yourself is, well, okay, how do we know whether some pleasure is higher or lower? Like, what is it? How do we know how to characterize them? What do we what are the signs that one belongs in one category or another? Okay, well, Mill, uh, he outlines what we now call the preference test. So there's a couple of elements to this. So the first thing he says is, of two pleasures, if there be one to which all or almost all who have experience of both give a decided preference, 
irrespective of any feeling or moral obligation to prefer it, that is the more desirable pleasure. And we're going to, I'll call this the uh, preference of competent judges. So what, what he's saying here is that if you have two pleasures and everyone who has tried bro- both prefers one over the other, then that is in fact good evidence that that pleasure is superior, and Mill thinks this will be the case of the higher pleasure. So he says, look, we at all, if you compared, for all the people who have struggled for a long time and solved a really difficult math problem or figured out a really difficult philosophical concept or studied hard for an exam on material they found very difficult and got an A, if you compare those pleasures to the simple pleasures of eating and sleeping and drinking and those sorts of things, everyone who's tried both, he thinks, would prefer the higher pleasures. And that itself is evidence that the higher pleasures are better. Okay. Um, so that's what he means by competent judges, just people who have tried both. Second, if one of the two is, by those who are competently acquainted with both, place so far above the other that they prefer it, even though knowing it to be attended with a greater amount of discontent. So this is a really important point. Those competent judges who we say, okay, they tried both pleasures and they prefer one over the other. And and the one they prefer, they prefer it even though they know it's going to cause a greater amount of discontent and dissatisfaction. Okay, well, well, why would that be? Well, go back to our example of working really hard to solve this difficult math problem and then you succeed. So it's worth thinking about, like, why would that cause a greater amount of discontent? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is the very process of working towards solving that problem itself is difficult, right? So you're going to experience a lot of failure um, along the way. And that's even that's if you succeed. In fact, you might be working on solving that math problem and never reach a final resolution. Or you might solve it and realize, wow, I solved this problem, but now I see there's so many more problems. This happens to me all the time when I'm thinking about a philosophical problem. I might have a question that I'm, you know, thinking about in my mind. I look at the possible answers and maybe I fix on one of those answers. And then after that, I'm saying, well, this brings up a whole host of new questions, which I don't have answers to. So there's something about the higher pleasures, which just does produce this greater amount of discontent. Although it produces a higher amount of pleasure when you succeed, there's a lot of struggle and there's a sense in which you're never fully satisfied. That's just what, that that just is how the higher pleasures are, right? So you, um, you know, let's take it in a different realm. So let's say you're training to, to, for a weightlifting competition. Let's say you break some barrier in lifting weights, some amount of weight. Uh, you say, okay, I want to lift 200 pounds. Okay, that feels good in the moment. You lifted 200 pounds, you achieved your goal, you had to work really hard. Are you content? Well, no. After that, you want to lift 250 pounds. Then you want to lift 300. When you're pursuing the higher pleasures, there, there is no, you're always going to be one, if you're really committed to them, striving for more and more, you're always going to be unsatisfied. And so what Mill is saying is that if people have tried two pleasures and they prefer one of those pleasures, even if it comes along with more dissatisfaction, then we know that pleasure must be superior because they're willing to bear the cost of dissatisfaction for it. And thirdly, if those competent judges would not resign that pleasure for any quantity of the other pleasure. So what he's saying, if if those competent judges, if they try both and they, they agree that one is superior, and they agree that that is superior, even though it causes discontent, and they would never give it up, no matter how much of the other pleasure, of any other pleasure they could have. So as a human being, you have these higher mental abilities to solve difficult math problems, to think about philosophy, etc. And so what Mill is saying is, for everyone who's genuinely tried both, has tried working their mind, studying philosophy, working on a difficult math problem, and has tried the pleasures of, of sensation, no human being would voluntarily give up their higher mental faculties. You wouldn't give up your ability to learn new things, to appreciate beauty, to form long-lasting, loving relationships, to work toward athletic goals. You wouldn't give that up for any amount of just mere sen- a pleasure of sensation, for any amount of pleasure you get from eating, drinking, sleeping, etc. 
So this is how we def- divides up the higher and lower pleasure. We know a pleasure is a higher pleasure, a better pleasure, if it meets all these criteria. Okay, now, I want to focus for me, for the rest of this lesson on this final point here. This idea that human beings would not give up the higher pleasures for any amount of the lower pleasure. Right? And, and he, in a couple of famous passages, this is how he expresses this point. Mill says, few human creatures would consent to be changed into any of the lower animals for a promise of the fullest allowance of a beast's pleasures. No intelligent human being would consent to being a fool. No instructed person would be an, an ignoramus. No person of feeling and conscience would, would be selfish and base. So first of all, he's making this claim that no, if you had a choice, if, if Genie comes down and says, you know what, I'm going to give you a choice. You can give up your human life right now and I will change you into one of the lower animals. Or I'll change you into a child. You know, you can go back to being a three-year-old, a four-year-old. You you pick the age, but you can go back to being some age where you really don't have your full mental, higher mental capacities. Mill is making the claim, and this may be a controversial claim, that no human being would prefer, would voluntarily choose to make that trade. Maybe. So he continues on. Even though they should be persuaded that the fool, the dunce, or the rascal is better satisfied with his lot than they are with theirs, they would not resign what they possess more than he for the most complete satisfaction of all the desires which they have in common with him. So the point he's making is that even if you recognize that a child or a dog or a pig or porky is more satisfied with their life, They have less dissatisfaction. And why would that be? Well, think about it. The desires of a child are very simple. They don't desire to learn more. They don't desire to appreciate difficult works of art. Uh, For the most part, they don't even desire or understand the concept of a truly deep and abiding and long-lasting loving relationship. And they're completely satisfied with their very simple desires, with their very simple way of life. They don't have any uh, discontent as long as those simple needs are met. And so he says, well, you can recognize that. You can look at Porky. You can look at a child. You can look at an animal and say, I, re- I realize they're completely satisfied and content with their life, but I'd still rather have my life with all its struggle, um, with all its discontent. I'd rather live the life I am where I'm able to pursue those higher pleasures. This is despite the fact that Mill says, a being of higher capacities requires more to make him happy and is capable of probably a more acute suffering. So we live a life where we can reach higher highs, right? The, we can pursue the higher pleasures, but we can also reach lower lows. Because we have such high ambitions, because we have high, such high goals, because we can strive after difficult things, we can also become disappointed. We can fail. Um, we can feel inadequate. And those are certain feelings that other beings just really aren't capable of in the same way. But despite all that, Mill still thinks that we're better off the way we are, that we're better off able to pursue the higher pleasures. And again, this goes back to his claim from earlier that the higher pleasures give you a different quality of pleasure, one that other beings simply aren't capable of. To evaluate this point, I want to look at one last passage here. So this is also is one of the famous lines from utilitarianism. Mill says, It is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. So I just want to bring this up, this comparison, to leave you with something to think about. Because what Mill is saying, we're comparing two different lives here. So let's compare the life of Socrates with the life of Porky. Porky's desires are easily satisfied. So he'll likely be perfectly content, and he's not going to suffer any severe disappointment. Right, Everything he wants is right there in the pigsty. He doesn't have to work hard for anything. He'll have a content life. He won't feel any dissatisfaction. Compare that to Socrates. Desires are, his desires are extremely ambitious. He told us that the goal of his life was to figure out what is the nature of virtue, how to live a good human life. He wanted a superhuman wisdom that he himself admitted 
he would never be able to obtain. So it's unlikely he'll ever be content, and he'll be more disappointed. Right? And this is exactly what Mill tells us. Socrates is likely to be dissatisfied. A fool who never thinks about such questions, who doesn't ask themselves any difficult questions, who doesn't pursue any difficult knowledge, is likely to be very satisfied. And that's Porky. But Mill is telling us it's better to be a so Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. And we might wonder, well, why is that? Well, let's let's sort of compare the sorts of things um, that Socrates and Porky might say. So here's a passage from the Apology. The famous passage, but again, if I say it's the greatest good for a man to discuss virtue every day and the other things you've heard me discussing and examining myself and others about, on the grounds that the unexamined life isn't worth living for a human being. Right, so remember Socrates has this famous conception of the of an examined life and an unexamined life, and he simply says, a life like Porky's that's unexamined isn't even worth living for a human. And when he thinks about, okay, would he rather give up philosophy to please the jury, or would he continue philosophy even at the cost of his own death? He says, I'd far rather die after such a defense than live like that. You see, whether in a trial or in a war, neither I nor anyone else should contrive to escape death at all costs. So what we see in Socrates is someone so committed to their craft, so committed to philosophy, he's literally willing to die for it. Okay, now this is a very high picture of what human beings are capable of. What of self-sacrifice? What of integrity? What do we see out of Porky? What would he say? Well, he'd say something like, today I rolled around the mud, oink. And when you compare those two different ways of living, those two different um, conceptions of a human being, there's certainly one that's more inspiring. There's certainly one that's more ambitious. And so when, what Mill tells us is that, why is it, and maybe he's wrong about this, and you, sir, I invite you to think about this, but why is it that we prefer having our higher faculties um, and wouldn't trade them away for an easier life? He gives a number of reasons. He says, well, we might attribute it to pride, a love of liberty and personal independence, right? A sense of, you know, being in control of our, uh, ourselves, being a free individual, to the love of power, excitement. But he says, the most appropriate way of expressing this is a sense of dignity. If you think there's a certain way a human being ought to live his or her life, if you think there's a dignified way a human being ought to live his or her life, then that should transfer over to what sorts of pleasures should we pursue. And for Mill, a dignified human life is one, well, not, he's not going to say that we can never pursue the lower pleasures, but it's one that's oriented around pursuit of the higher pleasures. And an undignified life would be one where we simply ignore our higher, our higher faculties, we let them degrade and deteriorate. Maybe we're not living a life like Porky, but, you know, a life of watching Netflix, playing video games, eating, drinking, sleeping, just pursuit of the basest pleasures. It's an undignified way of living, and at the end of the day, that is the major reason why Mill thinks we would not want to make such a trade. <laughs>